If you had a chance to say something to the families, what would you want to say? We are so sorry. We are heartbroken. We wish we could undo it, but we know we can't. In an era of mass shootings all too frequently, theirs is a perspective we do not often hear. Lisa and Todd Sturgeon are the parents of the young man who opened fire more than two weeks ago inside Louisville's Old National Bank. What scares you about doing an interview like this? We have a concern about inadvertently being disrespectful to the families. Our heart is just shattered for, for them and what they're going through. Something like this is so complicated. But at the end of it all, Connor did this. He did. And he, he did this to um, totally innocent individuals. There was no provocation no justification, no rationalization at all. They were just trying to do their jobs, provide for their families, and they will never be the same due to his actions. And that's, if we could take it back, we would. Connor Sturgeon was a 25-year-old employee at the bank. He killed five co-workers, Joshua Barrick, Thomas Elliott, Juliana Farmer, James Tutt, and Dina Eckert. Eight others were wounded, including a young policeman, Nicholas Wilt, still in critical condition after he was shot in the head. As we sit here, do you know why this happened? I don't think there's any way to know for, for sure. We know that, that Connor was struggling with some uh, mental health issues. I'm afraid that whatever we come up with as the cause isn't going, still isn't going to make sense. There was no clear tell. So this could happen to someone else, and we don't want that to happen. That's why you're here. That's why we're here. The Sturgeons say Connor's struggles started just a year ago. Panic attacks, anxiety, and an attempted suicide. But he was seeing a psychiatrist, a counselor, and taking medication. Things seeming to have settled until six days before the shooting. In the days leading up to this incident, what did you notice about Connor? Was he struggling? Yes, he, he called me on um, the Tuesday before the event, and he said, well, I had a panic attack yesterday, and I, want to leave, I had to leave work. And I said, okay, well, what happened? What, what was the cause? I don't know. I don't know what it was, but I, I think I should take off a while. And I said, that's, that's fine. You know, we're here to help you. Did you worry he was suicidal? That's also inconceivable to me. He was willing to talk to me. He had told us before he would never do such a thing like that to us. I said, I want to see you. I had lunch with him on Wednesday. The next day. The next day. I set up an appointment with his psychiatrist. We met with the psychiatrist on Thursday. You yes. joined the meeting with the psychiatrist. In fact, Lisa intervened and insisted that it get moved up. A and they thought we, we, we thought he was coming out of the crisis. The final time the Sturgeons saw their son was Easter Sunday. What was his demeanor? This is the day before the it shooting. Was fine. I've got a big extended family on my mom's side, so there's like 60 people at this egg hunt, and uh, he's helping people, the last people that are finding their eggs. He's out there doing that. He's choking. Mm -hmm. Went home with his buddy, and they're watching the last round of the Masters. The night before this happened. The night before. And little did you know that five days earlier, he had purchased... A weapon. No idea. No clue. Lisa was stunned when she received a call the next day. I picked it up and that was his roommate letting me know that um, I, I'm not really sure about the details, but it was something along the lines of um, Connor called his roommate and said, I left some notes there. Call my mother. I'm going to go in and shoot up. Old National. He told his roommate. I believe so. And, and he found the writings. And uh, the roommate said, he has a gun. And I'm like, he ha where'd he get a gun? We don't have guns. What's going through your mind at a moment like that? Unbelievable. There's no way this is happening. Please stop him. Please make sure nobody gets hurt. This cannot be happening. This is not him. You didn't dream he's going there to shoot Absolutely people. not. As I'm driving, then I get a call that says, there's been shooting in there, multiple shots. And uh, you go from praying for his life to praying that this is unimaginable. 
that he just commits suicide and doesn't hurt anyone else. You're racing to the scene. You call 911. He's nonviolent. Mm -hmm. He's never done anything. Please. You seem in shock. Mm -hmm. And you say, he's a good boy. Please don't punish him. And he punished others. And he took others' lives. He was able to purchase an AR-15. It was legal. Mm -hmm. Should he have been able to do that? Absolutely not. I think the overwhelming majority of Americans don't want people in an impaired state to have a weapon in their hand. Now, it becomes more complex to thread the needle and protect us from those people while still being conscious of the individual rights and liberties. So we're not out here on some crusade to restrict people from from buying guns. We have really smart people in this country, and there's no reason why we can't find a solution to this problem. You just said it. You're not on a crusade. You're not, you're not political people. Correct. You don't know what the change should be. You just know there should be change. Correct. Unfortunately, sometimes this conversation does fall along political lines, and there are some people who say it's about mental health. It's not about guns, it's about mental health. And then there's some people who say, no, it's about the guns. What are you saying? What we want to say is those two are interrelated to one another. In, in our situation especially, because of his mental condition, he should not have been able to purchase the gun. Because of his mental condition, if there had been a delay or something of that nature, that would have been helpful. Yeah, I, because, so here's what we know. We know that Connor was seeing two mental health professionals and that he was able to walk in and from what we've been told again I, I don't know all, you know just what we've been told is that he walked in and was walked out with uh, a weapon and ammunition in 40 minutes and it was six hundred dollars in less than an hour in less than an hour we, yeah. The Sturgeons want to see change on multiple fronts, the way mental health conditions are treated, especially the medications prescribed. They wonder if the concussions Connor sustained as an adolescent played any role. So many questions and no answers. What perspective do you think yours brings to this conversation? We've been, you know, obviously consumed by grief and, you know, uh, well-meaning people keep saying to us, you know, you did what... Uh, any, you know, uh, reasonable parents would have done. But Connor, in his darkest hour, needed us to be exceptional, not reasonable, and we failed him. We were not exceptional, and I guess if we can send a message to people um, that you, when you're faced with this, may have to go to exceptional means maybe that it can help open their eyes to this. What do you wish you had done? What would have been exceptional? For two weeks, we've been lying in bed awake at night, replaying all this in our head. There's no comprehension of him doing an act like this to others. So our issues are around the minutia of little things like, man, we didn't see that. If you know, even little things like, as men, we don't always verbalize things to each other, but uh, I think I'm going to pull the parachute <laughs> that, out of that answer and walk away from it. Um, I, I, I do want to say, though, I had no idea. And even when he was telling me that he was sort of in a crisis, we thought we had it handled. We, we thought it was being managed. He does not fit the profile. He wasn't a loner. He had a job. He had a girlfriend. He was successful. And he only had anxiety. He only had maybe panic attacks. That's it. And what happened to you is unthinkable. Mm -hmm. But you also did lose a son. And your son also did a terrible thing. And I just wonder what, how you deal with that. It would have been bad enough if we had just lost our son, but for him to take others with, us, with him, it's just, it's, it's beyond what we've taught him. 
the way we live, we're always saying do no harm. He didn't do that. People could look at you and say, if it could happen to you, it could happen to anyone. Do you feel like that? We've heard that. But I want to say, though, too, how many mass shootings have there been this calendar year already? It has been happening to other people like us, and we're continuing to let it happen. And, it, and we, we have to fix that. My gosh. It wasn't easy for them to come forward, and I can't express enough their concern mm -hmm. that they not do or say anything that in any way put the spotlight on their son mm -hmm. yeah. and take it away from the victims. Mm. Um, we did reach out to the victims. Um, four of the families did not have a comment. I think they wanted to see what they said. The family of Joshua Barrick did write us. They said he did nothing to deserve this. He simply went to work one day just like all of us do. The fact that anyone can walk in and buy a semi-automatic weapon, its only purpose being to kill many in seconds is simply wrong. Enough is enough. Inaction is not an option. We deserve to be safe in our community communities. We are simply heartbroken. This did not have to happen. You know, one of the other extraordinary things that the Sturgeons told me, mm. which <clears throat> some of a couple of the families of the mm -hmm. victims mm -hmm. had reached out to them mm. um, wow. to wow. say, we're praying for you too. And they um, were just absolutely astonished at the generosity and kindness of that. And, you know, I think they're just trying to walk forward, trying to mm -hmm. at least though it's not easy, say something yeah. to try to create some kind of change, whatever that change may be. They want, they want to be part of a solution. I'm just so struck by the fact that before the interview started rolling, I think everybody in their head has a vision of what they're going to see coming up. I think it's easy to demonize yep. and say, why didn't they do A, B, C, or D? And then you actually hear the parents who did A, B, C, D, E, and F. Oh, all of them. Yeah, and boy, it was very eye-opening. I don't know what I expected, but I, wow. that's, that's, that's a, yeah. That is a perspective yeah. I can literally say I've never yeah. heard. And, and, and to his point about needing to be an exceptional yeah. parent, I think as a parent, yeah. that's so scary. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you see a kid, you see yeah. your own child who's yeah. clearly struggling, and you go out and yeah. you get them the help time yeah. and time again. Things. You reach out. It's just, wow. it makes no sense. Yeah. It makes wow. absolutely no sense. We, sh we should mention, if you are watching or listening and you know someone who is struggling, you can always contact the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, that information on your screen. Call or text 988. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't miss the Today Show every weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 Pacific on our streaming channel, Today All Day. To watch, head to today.com slash all day or click the link right here.